Please take a look at the fixation point. We will show you 12 letters and digits. Try to remember as many as you can. Ready? If you're like most people, you probably remembered about 4 or 33%. Now let's make it easier. Next, you l l only need to remember one row, indicated by a tone. A high tone for the highest row, a medium tone for the middle row, and a low tone for the lowest row. Ready? Hopefully, this was easier because you heard the tone before you saw the stimulus. But what if we present the tone after the stimulus has disappeared? Ready? Most people are able to now recall the entire row, even if the tone is presented after the stimulus. This is possible because the stimulus is stored in iconic memory, which is an almost photographic but very short lived form of memory. We have known about iconic memory since the classical experiments of George Sperling in 1960. But we do not know where this information is stored in the brain. If we record the activity of a neuron in primary visual cortex, or V1, we see that it doesn't immediately stop responding when a stimulus disappears. To test if this decaying activity underlies iconic memory, we adapted Sperling's experiment and created a version that could be carried out by macaque monkeys. Instead of three rows of letters, we showed three pairs of curves, and the monkeys had to judge which curve of each pair was continuous and which one was not. Instead of an auditory cue, we used a visual cue in the center to indicate which target pair was relevant. The monkey had to make an eye movement to the purple circle that was on the continuous curve in the cued pair. We confirmed for the first time that monkeys have iconic memory, just as humans do. When we recorded the activity of the V1 neurons during this task, we found that the decaying parts of V1 activity, the shaded area, predicted the properties of iconic memory. In other words, we discovered a neural correlate of iconic memory.